If you're, if you're just jumping in with us, we've been in a series called Crack the Code. And uh, it was a three-week series. Now it's four weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and week one, I started, I'm like, listen, there's only three things. There's only three things, God, like that exists in the world. And First John tells us that there's only three things. And so uh, we were sent with the team. And I was like, guys, I got a fourth thing. <laughs> and they were like, what? You said there was only three. And I'm like, well, there is only three. Um, world systems, but I, I just kind of noticing something in our culture, I believe there's a fourth one that kind of drives or is the vehicle towards these three. And uh, we've just been talking about crack the code, Trojan horses. You ever heard of the story of Troy, right? They built a wooden horse, they hid inside, and it looked like a gift, it looked innocent, but once it got inside, it created a ton of destruction. And these world systems that are created really don't work for you. They work against you, but they look innocent enough that we invite them into our lives. And then we realize later, wow, this can cause some serious damage. And so we've been talking about our, our 21 days of prayer and Ephesians six twelve kind of lays it out like this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, cosmic powers, against the spiritual forces of evil, in heavenly places. And so there, there's this war Paul's writing to the Ephesian church. He's saying, hey, there's something that you can't see that's trying to work against you. It's trying to work against your faith. It's trying to work against your relationship with Jesus. It's trying to work against your marriage because God created that. It's, it's trying to work against your relationships and keeping them healthy. And, and he's saying, hey, there, there's a war that we can't see. Um, and then, and then it's written in John this way, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, these are the systems, the desire of the eyes and the pride of life is actually not from the father, but it's from the world. And so we just called these three things out using the New Testament, small g gods uh, that, we, that they used to serve. And it was these three, it was Baal, it was Asherah, and it was Mammon. And we said, okay, Baal's the god of power and pride. And Mammon is the god of possessions and riches. And Asherah is the god of pleasure or flesh. And the last three weeks, we kind of broke that down and kind of leaned into what that meant. And then today, I really felt like God was showing me something new. Actually, in a letter that Paul wrote, a young church planner and pastor. And his name is Timothy. And Paul actually uh, wrote, a couple different letters to pastors. Um, another one of their name was Titus, but, but he, he wrote two letters to Timothy that's actually recorded in our Bible, First Timothy and Second Timothy. And the letters that he wrote, Paul, Paul was a church planner. And so he would go and he would plant a church. He would set up the leadership and then he'd leave, go to another city and do it again. And so he left Timothy in charge in, in this city called Ephesus. And they were going through some stuff. There were some false teachings that were happening. There were little G gods. People were serving Baal and Asherah and Mammon. I mean, they were the Greek gods at the time, but essentially those things. And, and, and Timothy was having a hard time dealing with all the stuff that was happening in his city. And he was struggling with how to lead from a place of authenticity and power in God's spirit and also the battle he was facing because people were upset. And in the meantime, Paul is in prison. So his leader is in prison, and, and the letter he's writing is like, hey, hope you're doing all right. I'm about to die. Praise Jesus. Literally, if I could sum it up in the Matt translation, that's what it was. Praise Jesus, I'm about to die. For To live is for Christ, and to die is to gain. Paul says that. So he writes this letter to Timothy, and the whole letter is kind of written like, hey, I know you're timid. Timid Timothy, right? <laughs> I know you're afraid. I know you're scared. I know you're going through some stuff, but here's what I want you to do. And he just encourages Timothy in the midst of that. And one of the things he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it's, it's well, just one sentence of a whole letter, but it's powerful. It says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. How in the world did we get a part four of a three-week series? Can I tell you? As I was studying through, because there's the spirit of Baal, the spirit of Asherah, the spirit of Mammon, and the spirit of fear. I was like, well, the spirit of fear isn't like this little demigod. What, what, what is it? And I really believe just what God was teaching me is that the spirit of fear is the vehicle that will drop you off at Baal, Asherah, or Mammon. Because all three of those things want control. 
And when we allow ourselves to be given into the spirit of fear, you will really see one of those things as the result. See, mammon wants to control your finances and have more. And if we're afraid of not having enough, it'll drive us towards mammon. Baal wants power and esteem. And if we're afraid that we won't leave a mark or that our life doesn't matter or that we're not serving a purpose or that we're not having a legacy or we haven't climbed the corporate ladder, it'll drive us towards Baal. Fear fear will drive you towards Asherah because you're afraid you'll never be loved. And so you find and look and do things that are pleasurable to make you feel that way. But in the end, they're empty. So I really felt like God was saying, hey, we need to address the spirit of fear. It's actually the worst Uber you can pick up. <laughs> it's, it's not a good lift. You know, it's not going to take you to where you're going. You're going to be like, hey, my house isn't actually this way. And it's like, no, it's okay. I'm dropping you off somewhere else. You'd be upset. Every Uber driver, Lyft driver, if you hopped in the car and they just dropped you where they wanted, you'd probably be upset. And so we're going to really lean into what it means to talk about the spirit of fear. Is that all right today? Anybody, anybody notice that the spirit of fear seems to be prevalent today? Anybody notice that the spirit of fear seems to be on our news feeds, on our news channels, in our homes? I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And I really feel like God has some things to say to his church this morning. Amen? You with me? Yell at me if you're here this morning. Yell on the chat for me if you're there. And uh, let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. I really believe you want to uh, transform this morning hearts and mindsets and Uh, God, we just give fear and eviction notice today. God, I pray for courage and strength in your church. And God, I pray that we would be uh, not only encouraged with with, with your word, but we wouldn't be just inspired through your word, but we would be transformed through your word. That our lives and our minds would change because you've said some things that really could bring us freedom. And so God, I just pray for the freedom from fear in Jesus' name for your church. Amen. Amen. I, uh, fear, fear is something, <laughs> I, guess, I don't know if it's learned or just whatever, but anybody just deal with fear. You don't have to shout at me. It's okay. Uh, but I, I know fear. I, I've been afraid of a lot of things. Uh, if it creeps and it crawls, I'm not about it. I don't do cockroaches. I don't do spiders. If it flies in the air and it's insects, I don't do it. You know what I mean? Like you, you want to see me jump real quick, do some insects. And you know, when I, I'm, I'm not about that life. I don't play with critters. They're not to be played with. And uh, I'm like, they don't play with me. I don't play with them. And I, I'm just not about it. I, I had a strong fear of heights for the longest time. And God has a sense of humor. And I worked on a 60 foot rock tower uh, for a, a couple years. So that kind of helped me a little bit, but just a strong fear of height. Skydiving sounds like a death trap. It does not sound fun. And, and uh, people talk, oh man, it's going to be exhilarating. I'm like, no, I'm not about it. And I've just been afraid about a lot of things. But one of the things I haven't really, really been afraid of, uh, ironically, is, is dying. And it's kind of weird because uh, I've told my wife before, and she doesn't really like this statement. I'm like, hey, you know, if, if I ever die, like, keep going on with your life. And to, she's like, why are you talking about this stuff? <laughs> why? I'm like, well, I just, you know, you're, you're young, and uh, we're young. I just, you know, make sure we have a plan. Like, if for whatever reason I go home, I'm telling you, I'm good. Like, I'm in the presence of God. So, like, I'm all right. And this is just what I've read through here. What Paul who is sitting in prison. He's going, I'm about to be executed. But let me tell you, to live is for Christ and for his glory. But man, to die is to gain because I have something better on the other side. And, and when I read that, it's not just something I read and think it's cute. It's something I really want to get inside of my soul and be able to get inside of my spirit and go, my goodness, dying is actually a gain. But boy, there's a lot of fear of death right now. And I think what makes the gospel so powerful is the very thing that we see in our world system, which is a fear of death, talks about something different. The fact that Jesus actually overcame death, hell, and the grave. I was getting on a flight one time and it it was irrational. It made no sense. Uh, But I was getting on a flight. I was by myself and I, I hopped on a flight. I went to go visit a friend in North Carolina and I was headed home. And um, I've never really been afraid of flying because there's just something about having something under your feet. You know what I mean? I'm afraid of heights, but there's something about having some, some ground underneath me. And so when there's a plane in the sky and I can still touch the floor, I feel good. 
And, uh, and I, we got in the plane, we're getting ready to take off, and I just found myself overcome with fear. Like irrational thoughts. Oh my gosh, what if we go to take off and the landing gear breaks and the plane falls on its nose and it blows up right now and I die? Please, please, I hope this pilot knows what he's doing. And we're, and we're getting, the, you know, you hear the engine start humming, and I'm like, it's about to blow up. You know what I mean? Every movie, I'm replaying Lost, Manifest. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be stuck on an island, and then season six isn't even going to be worth it. And so I, I, like I, was, I was just kind of freaking out, right? And, 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 I found my, and I found myself as we kind of got into the air, and I was perfectly fine. By the way, we made it home. Um, I'm here today. We made it. Shout out to the pilot. And uh, when we were in the air, I found myself going like, you know, and just being like, God, why, why am I afraid right now? And he's like, well, the older you've gotten, the more you fear you have to lose. Because you got some kids now. And you fear not being there. And you're married now. And you have a home and you got finances and responsibility. I realize the older I've gotten, the more the temptation to be afraid of loss has been present in my life. And it was irrational on this plane. And I started coming down off the plane. I just kind of wanted to give you some hope today. And this is, this is what I feel like God was teaching me. I am not promised tomorrow, but I am promised eternity. I hope, I hope we can get that. Yeah, come on, right? I hope we get that in our, and I, I, I just felt like God was saying, hey, you may not be promised tomorrow, but let me tell you, you are promised eternity. And it's all throughout here where our life is but a vapor, and I may not be promised tomorrow, but I am promised eternity. I think one of the greatest lessons my mom had ever taught me is to trust in something that's better than her. I'm telling you, I'm Mama's boy at heart, you know what I'm saying? Like, my mom's everything. But my mom always taught me that if I always trusted and leaned in her, I would be trusting and leaning in something temporary. So she had to point me to something eternal. She said, don't put your hope and faith and trust in me. Put your hope and faith and trust in Jesus. Because she is temporary. She's not promised tomorrow, neither am I. But you know who is promised eternity? You and I. And Jesus. He is eternal. So when my mom leaves this earth, I have something that I have an anchor to, Hebrews says, that is for my soul in the name of Jesus. So it's like, okay, well, what are some of the things that we're talking about with fear? Can I give you some fear facts? Point one, fear facts. I'm just gonna give you fear factor, you know what I mean? Can I give you just some things I've noticed about fear? Here's the first one. Fear wants to paralyze you. Fear wants to paralyze you. There's a story in the Old Testament, and we're, we're going to read some of it, but David goes up against this, this, this Goliath, this giant. That's where Goliath comes from. His, his name is Goliath. It's this giant. It's the Philistine representative of strength and power. It was Baal, actually. Goliath is, is representing the Philistine army and Israel is lined up against the Philistines and they're going to war. And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 17, 8 through 11. It says, Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel. And this is, this is what he said. Listen, this is, what, this is what threats will do in order to get you afraid. Because can I tell you, it was Goliath in that time. But anybody notice that there's some threats in our world today? And they're boasting and they're yelling and they're screaming. I mean, threat to your finances, threat to your health, threat, threat, to, threat to your relationships. There's, there's all of these threats that yell at us all the time. And, and in this moment, it's Goliath. For us, it might be something else. But this is what the threat begins to yell in order to create fear. Why don't you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are not you the servants of Saul, who was the king of Israel at the time? He says, choose a man to come down and fight me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then Philistine, the, the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight together. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites, read this, were dismayed and greatly Afraid. 
Why? Because what we're hearing affects what we feel. Can I just help somebody today? What you're allowing into your ears while it's being processed is going to land in a couple of areas. One is fear and one is faith. And what's happening to the Israelite army is they are listening to the voice of the threat, processing it, and it's landing in fear. Anybody ever been there? I hear the threat. I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. And it begins to try to paralyze you from moving forward. Scripture says that Goliath came out every day, stood in between the two armies and said, send me somebody that can fight. Send me. And day after day, the threat just starts screaming. And he posted on his Facebook and he would shoot out a tweet and be like, yeah, Israel got nothing on me. Come on, somebody from Israel, come get me. He'd post photos on Instagram. Here's the really fearful Israelite army that supposedly serves God. God, afraid to come to fight. He would boast. And I feel like the enemy does that to you and I. Oh, you said that you weren't going to. Oh, you thought that. And he just begins to speak lies over your life. And he just begins to speak fear. And all of these things start to open up inside of our hearts. And we're going, man, what I'm listening to can actually lead me to a place of fear. They were discouraged because of the report that they heard. And then it says, In verse 23, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and he shouted his usual defiance. Anybody just been getting reports that now now they're just usual? They just keep coming? Anybody notice that the enemy's lies over your life, they just tend, they tend to be almost the same thing? Says there was, He came out and he said the usual defiance and David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So the first thing is what I hear could create fear. And then the second thing is what I see because they were discouraged by what they saw. They were discouraged by what they heard. And this threat would stand before them, lying to them over and over and over and over. And they were discouraged because of what they saw and what they heard. So the first, the first fear fact is fear wants to try to paralyze you. How does it do that? Because it talks and because it's big. A second fear fact is the enemy actually has more to fear than I do. I mean, I'm just reading through this and I'm going... Like, I know the end of the story. Like, I can skip to the end of the timeline of the book. Like, this is Avengers Endgame. You know, like, but I saw that movie first before I saw the rest. I mean, there's, there's just something about when you're reading God's word and you're going, wait a second, wait a second. You're telling me that God actually says some things that can impact my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, he gives you the end of the story. Why? Because the enemy is defeated, not only today, but forever. So what's the second fear fact? Well, that the enemy has more to fear than I do. See, David shows up at the army and he looks, he looks at this, their champion who's, who's yelling and who's cursing, who's defying the army of Israel, who's defying, can I just put it this way? There's, there is a real threat that is yelling at God's church today. That's yelling at God's kids today. And it wants to get you paralyzed and afraid because of what you see and what you hear. But the reality of that threat is, boy, you got more to be afraid of than I do. So David shows up on the scene and he's like, man, I don't think, I don't think this giant knows who he's messing with. And all of the army's looking at him going, dude, don't mess with Goliath. He's a big dude. He's like, I don't think he knows how big my God is. Yeah, but dude, yeah, you're, you're, just, a, you're just a boy. Like you're youth. You're like, you're young. Yeah, but, but what you're looking at, at the threat. I'm looking at my God. And so it says that he, he goes out to the Philistine and he's standing before him and the, and, and, and the threat gets worse because it went, it went from global to personal. Anybody notice that the enemy will do that real quick? The moment you take a step of faith, he'll go from, you need to be afraid of these things to, do you know who you are? Do you know what you've done? 
The enemy will get real personal real quick. And David is standing there right before this enemy. And it says that in, in, in 1 Samuel 17, David said to the Philistine, this is what he told him. You come at me with your sword and your spear and your javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Homeboy, I don't know who you think you're messing with. You didn't insult me. You, inserted the God, you, you insulted the God that I serve. I don't know who you think you can throw your threats at and who you think needs to be afraid because greater is he in me than he that is against the world. I got to tell you, there's something stronger today than the fear that you'll be throwing. David said, let's go. You want to throw down? Because you don't know. Look Baal in the face. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you got your sticks and stones, your javelin and your sword and your spear. It says, this day, love the faith of David. The Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'm going to strike you down. And I'm going to cut off your head. And this very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here today will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves me. What does that mean? It's not by the world system that the, world, that the Lord saves you. Because, because you're going to be struck down today because you're a threat who's defying God. But let me tell you, it's not by the same world system. It's not by the results that I want. It's not by the same weapons of war. Ephesians 6 says that we don't battle against flesh and blood. Well, I'm not even here to battle you how you think I'm about to battle you. I'm going to battle you in the things that you can't see. He said, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves because the battle's the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. What did David do? David didn't fight with worldly weapons. He fought with spiritual ones. I really believe today, we're gonna get to the ancient path here in a second, but I believe that there is a spiritual weapon that the church needs to carry today. It's got a little rust on it. It's been sitting a little bit too long on the sidelines. So fear wants to paralyze you. The enemy has more to fear than I do. And here's, here's the third point. Fear is not from God. What do I do if I feel afraid? I'm not telling you that you can't feel afraid. Anybody ever felt afraid? I did on a flight. I did on a rock tower. I'm not saying don't feel afraid. What I'm saying is we have to know where fear comes from. Because fear does not come from God. 2 Timothy 1 through 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear. So can I, can, I, can I put it this way? If fear doesn't come from God, where does it come from? There's only two systems. God's and the world's. There's only, there's only what heaven is doing in God's kingdom and what the enemy is doing with his kingdom. So if fear doesn't come from God, can I tell you, it comes from the enemy. Because it doesn't come from God. So when you start feeling afraid, it should be an instant sign, God did not send this to me. When I start feeling afraid, I have to start going with what I know instead of what I feel, which was beautifully articulated a couple minutes ago. I've, I've got to lean into what has God been saying rather than what I have been feeling. So if God didn't give me the spirit of fear, what did he give me? Check it out. I love it. Three things. He gave us three things. He didn't give us Baal. He didn't give us Asher. He didn't give us, he didn't give us fear. But he did give us three things. You want to know what he gave us? Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God gave us a spirit, not a fear. You just put it up here. Somebody say power. Somebody say love. Somebody say self-control. Somebody type it online. He gave us power. He gave us love. And he gave us self-control. God gave us three things as gifts. Power, if you actually break down that word in, in the Greek, it's, it, it's dunamis, which uh, basically means it's miraculous power or the ability to see God move. So he didn't just give you power like Baal power. He gave you power that comes from a kingdom that you can't see. He gave you the ability to have faith, to pray and see things change. He gave us, he gave us power. What, well, what else did he give us? Well, he gave us love. Well, what does that mean? Well, that, that word actually is agape, which is an eternal, everlasting, supernatural type of love. 
So he says, okay, so he gave us the power, the ability to carry out what he gave us to do. He gave us love, which is eternal, supernatural. And then he gave us self-control. And other translations say it this way, a sound mind. All day and age where we need a church with a sound mind. I mean, we can clap there. That's fine. I'm just saying we are in a day and age where we need to be equipped as ministers. Can I say it that way? Like if, 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 just so you know, like God has called you to ministry. He calls the pastors, prophets, teachers to equip you, the saints, for the work of the ministry. Can I equip you with something today? God gave you power, love, and self-control or a sound mind. That's for the believer. You know why the world acts the way it does? Because it can't have a sound mind. It has an emotional one, an irrational one. But he gave us power, love, and a sound mind. Well, why did he give us those things? What do we do with those things? 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love. Why did God give us love? Because there's no fear in love. Are you telling me fear and love are directly opposed? Oh yeah, I'm telling you they're directly opposed because there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. What does this mean? Can I tell you, you have a God that loves you? I'm not just saying it, like you have a God that loves you. And his perfect love can actually cast out the fear that you feel. My kids, my kids will um, sometimes come to me and they'll go, Daddy, I'm afraid. I think it's just because they're trying to get out of their bed during bedtime. Anybody in the middle of the toddler hustle, you know? I'm scared. And I'm like, of what, dude? They never really know. This is how I know they're just sneaking out of bed, you know? But they know my, it just melts my heart. When my kid comes to me and says that they're afraid, I'm not gonna be mad at them. But there's moments where they're afraid. Like my oldest is super afraid of lizards. I'm not afraid of lizard. I'm bigger than a lizard. He's bigger than a lizard. But he's afraid of lizards. Like he, lizards paralyze him. He will be walking and go, Daddy, there's a lizard 4.6 miles this way. <laughs> I can't move. And I'd be like, man, just run at the lizard and yell. He'd be like, mm-mm. Kaden, every time. Kaden, go get the lizard. Kaden will run over. Ah, you know. <laughs> Ever since Kaden was a year and a half, two years old, he'd run over and the lizard would run. Michael would be like, thank you. He's smart. He's a leader. He delegates. And, uh, <laughs> But he just get afraid. But every once in a while, there's, fra- there, there's fear so paralyzing, he starts to cry. And he's just frozen. And do you know what my natural heart response to him is? One, I get a whole lot closer. Two, I wrap him in my arms. And I don't go, son, let me explain to you why you shouldn't be afraid of the lizard. Let me, let me break this down, why you shouldn't be afraid of the dark right now. Look, light on, light, light on, light off. Nothing changes in the room. I, I don't logically try to explain to him. I actually don't even say very much about his fear. Because even though his fear is very real, and even though his fear is what he feels, I'm trying to get him to know something greater than his fear. So we don't even talk about what he's afraid of. Half the time, he doesn't even know. I grab my four-year-old. I put my arms around him. I get down on the floor and I hold him and I look at him in the eye and I go, do you know how much I love you? If daddy is here, what do you have to be afraid of? I feel like we're dealing with a lot of fear right now. And I just want to paint a picture that God wants to put his arms around you and say, do you know how much I love you? And if your dad is here in the midst, what do you have to be afraid of? David wrote a Psalm. He said, and of whom shall I be afraid? For if the Lord is with me, 
What am I saying to somebody that doesn't really follow Jesus? What I'm saying is that there's a God that so loves you. His presence is so close to you. He wants to keep you even in the midst of fear because that love is that powerful because perfect love casts out fear. Can I talk to the believer for a second? Can I talk to somebody that believes in Jesus? The song that says, I am who you say I am. Can I tell you that you have some authority because of Christ's cross, because of his sacrifice, and because he sits at the right hand of the Father, that there's some authority for the believer to actually walk and say and pray and do some things that would change the circumstances we see in our life? Can I, can I equip you with the fact that we serve a God who doesn't just wrap you up and say that I love you, but he equips you and empowers you to walk that life that he's called you to live? So what does that mean? If you're taking notes, write this down. Evict your fear. What does that look like? It looks like the moment you start feeling afraid, you run to the arms of a father that you know loves you. And you go, God, fear is not supposed to be here. I know fear doesn't come from you. So I'm bringing my fear to you believing you're going to do something with it. We evict it. We give it an eviction notice. You know, if I came home from a trip and somebody was sitting in my living room watching my TV, I might be, one, afraid. Two, I'd be like, who the heck are you? Three, you know what will be the first words? Get out. Get out. Who the heck are you? Get out. You don't belong here. What is this talking about? Perfect love casts out fear. You know what perfect love does? It busts the door of your heart open and it walks in and it goes, fear, what are you doing here? There's no room for fear because love occupies this place. So you have been given your eviction notice. You're squatting in an area and a territory you have no right to be in. Leave. There's times where I am literally afraid, whatever it might be. This is, this is practical. Sometimes you just got to go, get out. Leave me alone. You will not win this battle. You do not get to keep me afraid. You do not get to keep me at a place where I am paralyzed. You do not get to keep me in a place of depression. I know that I've been afraid of what might be, but let me tell you of a God who is. Get out. We evict fear. Well, what does that? Reminding yourself that you have a God that loves you. Isaiah 26, 3 says it this way, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts on you. So what do we do with fear? Well, the first thing is we evict fear. The second thing, if you want something practical, we turn our fear. We turn it. I'm not naive enough to believe that we're never gonna face fear again. I'm just wondering if we know what to do when we face it. You evict it, and then you turn it. We actually can, can change our minds, self-control, a sound mind, right? He gave us, he gave us love, agape. Man, I, I know that I'm loved, and so I got nothing to be afraid of because God loves me. The second thing, we have a sound mind. We have a mind of self-control. Actually, for the believer, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. That's because if we're not following Jesus, we actually don't have a lot of self-control. You might have worldly discipline, but we do not have a sound mind because the peace that surpasses understanding comes from Christ. And so all of a sudden, I can turn my fear. Well, what does that look like? Change your mind. Start thinking about something different. Take that fear and say, okay, this is what I'm feeling, but now I'm going to tell what I'm feeling, what I know. Too many times we don't know what to do because we don't know what God has said. 
Too many times we can be paralyzed in fear because we have not been equipped with the ammo of God's word. And I'm telling you, Google's amazing. Do a Google search, verses on fear. Put three or four of like, if you struggle with fear and anxiety and stress and, and worrying about things that probably will never be. I'm not saying it won't ever be, but probably will never be. But, but, but you're, you're already facing the consequence now of a reality that hasn't even happened. That's what fear does. If you struggle with that, grab some of those scriptures and start filling our mind with things that we can turn our fear to. So when fear shows up and starts saying some of its lies and its taunts, I can go, I don't think you know who you're messing with because my Lord has already told me you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And so God, I turn my mind to you right now in Jesus name. All the things that I'm worried about, I'm going to start talking about what you have already said to me. I'm going to start praising you. I'm going to thank you for the things I've seen you do. I thank you that you restored my parents' marriage. I thank you that you brought forgiveness between my dad and I. I thank you that you healed my second born. I I thank you that I mean, we just start saying, I'm telling you, when you turn your mind, you have a whole lot less to be afraid of and a whole lot more to be thankful of. We turn it. That's what David did. He said, I'm not going to react to the Philistine. I'm going to respond. We can put that up there. We respond to fear. We don't react. We respond. David said, I'm going to respond to this Philistine. I'm going I'm to I'm turn my focus onto what I know God has said. And I'm going to evict fear from this battlefield. Jeremiah 6, 16. says, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. We've read this every week for the last four weeks. It says, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Can I tell you, fear is a crossroad. Fear wants to lead you to Baal. Fear wants to lead you to mammon. Fear, fear wants you to think you won't have enough. Fear wants, I mean, fear wants to lead you to those things. And so what, what, what is Jeremiah the prophet saying? He's saying, stand by the roads and just, just look. Just look. Hey, I've learned some of the greatest lessons of my life watching somebody else make a mistake I didn't have to. What is he saying? He's saying, just look. Look, where, look at the result and the fruit of that person's life and what they did. So, I'd rather not learn the hard way. Anybody, anybody with me? I'm stubborn though, boy. So I learned the hard way. <laughs> but I'd rather not. And so it's saying, st stand and look at the roads and then ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the old truth in a modern world. Because I'm telling you, we live in a world that's afraid. We live in a world that is, that, that is out of its mind right now with the amount of things it has positioned and, and, and posted and, 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 and lifted up to be afraid of. I mean, we got, that's why I got off social media for a little while. I'm still staying up to date. We got to be, be alert and sober and vigilant and pray. I got to know what's going on. But I got to tell you, I don't need all these idols of fear standing up in my life. If I know I struggle with fear, why would I allow it to stand in my living room? So I just got off for a little bit. I'm not saying that's for everybody. I just, I just, I, I had, for me. I was, I was like, you know what? Y'all keep me informed. <laughs> Staff, my wife, and like, y'all keep me up to date. But I just need to get away for a second because I need to continue to see what God is doing. If not, I will be paralyzed and not walk out the mission that he has given me with my life. And so we're standing at the roads and we're looking and we're asking for the ancient paths. God, what is the old way? We got a lot of new things, but what's the old way? What's the old path where the good way is? That when you walk in it, I find rest for my soul. Like, where's that pathway? Where's the pathway that, 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 that instead of taking fear as the vehicle, where's the pathway that's going to lead me towards rest? Where's the pathway that's going to lead me towards peace? Because you keep in perfect peace all of those who keep their mind on you. Can I tell you what the ancient path is? Prayer. Pastor, I don't think you understand. I've been dealing with fear. Prayer. Prayer. I don't think you understand. I've been dealing with Asherah. I've been, prayer. Prayer. Oh, that's cute. It's church. Prayer. No, 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 no. Prayer. 
oftentimes people will be like, man, some of the takeaways are like, like I don't understand. I'm like, I've been there. Do you know why I thought that takeaway for prayer was, because I didn't pray. So I would hear, you need to pray. And I'm like, all right, all right. But for real, I need something I'm like to actually get over this fear thing. It, put, put up the ancient road scripture. It's an old path. It's an ancient way. But can I tell you, it's an effective one. And can I tell you, it'll lead you to peace. And can I tell you, it'll lead to where you have rest for your soul if we actually prayed. I'm not saying pray because it's cute, because the Bible says it. I'm saying it because it's the only thing that works. It's the only system that God put into place because prayer exchanges my fear for his peace. You want to know how to, how, to, how to turn fear? Pray. You want to know how to evict fear? Pray. You want to know how to win the battle of, of stress and anxiety and the things that are overtaking your life right now because of social media and all the stuff that's happening in our world? Pray. You want to know what would be effective because we're not physically in Afghanistan right now? Pray. This is not a cute little post on Instagram that just says, pray for Afghanistan. I'm talking like pray for Afghanistan. I'm not, I'm not saying post about uh, praying for Haiti. I'm talking about praying for Haiti. I'm talking about 21 days of prayer and showing up on Saturday and saying, I got a God that I told, totally wholeheartedly believe in that when I pray, he listens. And not just that he listens, but he changes things in my life. You've got a heavenly father that so loves you. He draws you unto him in this last 21 days of prayer. The first Saturday, God was so clear. We're getting ready to pray corporately. We're all right here in the front. We've been praying for your prayer requests for 21 days. So many prayer requests. So many people dying of COVID. So many people just heartbroken over Afghanistan. So many people struggling with what, what, what we're seeing in Haiti. So many people that know somebody that passed away. And they're saying, pray, pray. Why? Because it works. It exchanges my fear for his peace. It doesn't always give me the result that I want, but it changes me. It doesn't always change the circumstance the way I want it to change the circumstance, but it changes my soul. It, it, it helps me stand a little taller. It helps me look at what's happening in our world and go, eh, Paul, I love the way you wrote it. To live is for Christ, but boy, I have nothing to fear in death. Can we imagine a church that believes that statement with all that they are? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. Somebody say everything. That's what God showed me first week of 21 days of prayer. He said, Matt, you're my kid. And I never grow tired of hearing your voice. You're my kid. Well, what do we pray about? Everything. Yeah, but does God really want to hear everything? Yeah, but sometimes I feel like everything. You know what? My kids could be whiny and complaining. Sometimes I'm like, come on, we got to address how you're approaching this. But I'm never tired of hearing their voice. I think sometimes our prayers can sound whiny and complainy, but let me tell you, don't let the enemy trick you to think that God doesn't want to hear it. It says in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. This is the promise, which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you, somebody should be encouraged today if you've been struggling with what's been going on in our world, if you've been struggling at home, if you have suffering from people that are lost, because what this scripture is telling me is that the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, so it goes beyond my mind, because I can't explain to you how a peace that surpasses my mind can make me feel whole, even though my circumstances haven't changed and my feelings haven't gone away yet but it'll guard my heart and my mind. That's what prayer does.
Prayer brings a, brings a peace that will guard your mind when you're scrolling through social media. Prayer brings a peace that will guard your soul when, when, when you're dealing with the taunt from the enemy. Prayer brings a peace that you're able to look death in the face and go, I have lived a life well lived. And I'm just stepping into an eternity. We're going to pray. Can we stand up? We're going to pray together. But before we pray, my mentor passed away. I talked about him last week, uh, March 4th. I forgot what year, but I remember being at the hospital bed. His organs were shutting down, liver shutting down. He was in bed shape. Jaundice didn't even look like himself. And um, I just got to lean over when, when he was still coherent. I just got to look at him and say, you're going to go be with Jesus. Tell him, hey. But you need to know you changed my life. You need to know you live a life well lived and you help me find freedom. And with tears in both of our eyes, it was like we were sending him home. And I still grieved and I still felt loss. But when you know you're going to gain, is it really ever a loss? If I put something in a storage unit, it doesn't mean it's gone forever. I just got to go back and get it. I'm telling you, I'm going to see him again. I'm going to see him again. This is the hope. And, and this is a different message for a different day. But this is like the old type of preaching. Like heaven is our home. You know, the, the old hymns that just say, this is not my home, I'm headed. Uh, that's real. It's not really being preached right now. But that heavenly eternal perspective is what we need right now. And so I just want to pray for you if we close our eyes and bow our heads. If, if you're just saying, man, I need, a, I, I need that peace that surpasses understanding. I need that eternal perspective. I need to be able to, to get some prayer in my life and watch my soul change. Just put your hand up high in the air and put it back down. Yeah, I, all right, I see those hands. I see those hands. God, I thank you that you are not afraid of what's happening in our world. I thank you not one time have you sat on your heavenly throne and been afraid of what you're seeing that we see on our social media feed. And God, I pray for a peace that surpasses understanding. I pray for a peace that would guard the hearts and the minds in Christ Jesus, your word says. God, I pray for a church that would, even when they feel afraid, they'd pray. Even when they feel anxiety, they'd pray. Even when they have stress, they would pray. That every time the enemy tries to trick them, they would turn it into prayer. They would turn it into praise. They would turn it into worship. And that he would lose simply because every scheme he has turns it back to God. I pray you fill your church with boldness and confidence and the peace that you want to have them to live. God, fill them with your love. That's eternal. Pathway to peace in prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on. Can we worship this one more time together? Love y'all. Hey, thank you for watching our Grow Life Church YouTube channel. Our hope is always to help you better connect to all that God has for you. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a thing. Fill out a digital connect card so that we can stay connected with everything that's happening in and through our community. You can also support the mission by giving online as we continue to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Thank you again for watching. We hope to see you soon.